I wanted to know, as a mother and an environmentalist, are you optimistic about the future? So I see optimism as not being a necessary feeling or characteristic for doing what needs to be done. So the true answer is, am I optimistic that we are going to create a planet in which we honor all forms of life and all peoples of the world? The answer is maybe and probably no. A lot of times when I go and give talks, people ask me, am I hopeful? Where do I find hope? Do I stay hopeful? Okay. And hope means almost nothing to me. Wendell Berry has a Sabbath poem where he says, let us learn to live without hope for a while to see what it's like, because there have been lots of people, lots of people in their lives have been forced to live without hope, and yet find the embers that make you keep moving forward, and not just, not just existing, but thriving. So optimism has never been that important to me. It's something else motivates me, and it's, um, it's probably love more than anything. So how do I stay filled with love. I keep working on keeping my eyes open and my heart open to this amazing world that's around us all the time. I wake up every morning and there's a big fat orange sun rising across the pasture and great crystal flycatchers are calling and bluebirds are calling. Um, that's where my hope comes from, is hanging on to some of that. The other thing, Array, is fight. And I think we could call it as uh, we could call it life force, and especially as a parent, you 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 know this in the center of your being, because it was that life force that created that child mm -hmm. to start with, and now you have to try to create a world that's going to sustain and nourish that child mm -hmm. and nourish yourself at the same time. So even if I don't have much hope, I have plenty of fight. I have plenty. I want to be a force of nature. You know, I don't want anybody, I don't want you to be a force of nature in doing what is right. So, so therein, I believe, lies one of the most important lessons of our time, which is figuring out what is right. There are a lot of stories that we've been told that obviously have, been, have not been leading us toward what is right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in the, in the fix that we're in. So... It's so great, you know, that I think we have to make of our, of our lives a study in ethics, a study in learning. What is the right thing to do? And once something is right, if your consciousness is raised enough, it becomes the only thing to do. And that's usually going to be an action. So I was really struck when reading at House of Branches about how much of a love letter. It felt like a real love letter to Georgia. Mm -hmm. Especially. Especially that middle section. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, but I read somewhere that you described Aplin County as about as ugly as a place can be. Mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and I really empathized with you mm -hmm. um, as a freshman leaving her home to come to a brand new environment. Where did you come from? Arizona, mm -hmm. so it's really different. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know if you could expand on the idea of home and place and where that fits in this environmental movement. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, that the most alive, aware people are, are, are also people who are somehow committed to a place. And um, let me think a minute of why I think this. Um, I believe, I believe that there are a few things that make a person whole, and one is to be whole is to be connected to the land. That if you don't have that, so, so I'm taking a very risky stand here to say that somebody who has no connection to the landscape is not whole. Right. But I'm still going to say it because I think there are things that the land and a sense of place give you that can be gotten no other way. I'm not saying that you couldn't have a sense of place in the city. I think you could. But I believe that land is that important in the makeup of our psyches. We talk about scenery as being just the place where some plot is set, you know. It's just scenery is peripheral. 
but I don't think scenery is peripheral at all. I think, I think our relationship with land is at the core of our beings. And I think it's, it's high time that we realize that we are biological beings every minute of every hour. And to be more whole is to understand how those systems work and how we fit into those systems. I also think that being fully human, fully whole, less fragmented, means understanding the processes of our survival. You know, yeah. so you're not relying on you're you're just going to the grocery store and buying your food. No, understanding the processes of survival means you're understanding where the energy is coming from that's allowing this interview to be possible. That you're you know something about if a drop of water falls at your door, where it goes to re reach the ocean. So mm -hmm. your watershed. What created this shelter? What what got destroyed so that we could be safe here from the rain falling outside. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, I believe, and hopefully participate, I, I, would, th I would hope that the next step would, you, would be a person participating in the processes of survival. Yeah. And to do so, to me, makes you more fully human because you understand your vulnerability, you understand survivability. So beyond that, and this is not your question, but beyond that, I think um, part of being fully human and being whole is also to be to feel and be fully connected to, wholly connected to all the people around you, your your lover, your family, your mother, your children, your clan, your neighborhood, and out and out and out to the world, so that. A wound against anybody is also a wound against you. And that's enough. I also believe that there's a, a spiritual element to, to our lives on this planet. And I think that part of that spirituality also comes through the land so we can circle back around again there a little bit. Yeah. So your question was what place means to us. Yeah. And I, I think I think that the homelessness that so many of us feel about not having a place in the world is tremendously damaging to the human psyche. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We have sort of condemned a lot of people in this world to homelessness, psychic homelessness. Your poems, especially Revolution, mm -hmm. um, suggest that you feel this sort of impending and natural global movement, this this revolution of, mm -hmm. of moving towards 350 and moving towards a more local um, way of living. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what are the details that you envision that revolution including? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and, and and I think I think you know this idea of transition towns mm -hmm. of us preparing for what's coming ahead. Um, do you know, do you know the the membranes that we move through? You know, we move from the womb through a membrane into yeah. life, and we move from life through a membrane into death. I think it's that that's sort of a metaphor for what's happening. That we're, you know, we're a lot of our systems are crashing, and some are ending. The era of fossil fuels, for mm -hmm. example, and I believe that we're headed very quickly toward one of those windows that we have to pass through. And it's not a bottleneck, it's really sort of a curtain yeah. or a membrane. And on the other side of it, there are people, like this is what is so great about being at Warren Wilson, is you're already preparing yourself for the future, for a life that's going to be very, very different, but it's gonna make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. And you are doing on the ground, grassroots, hands-on, hard work, organizing, um, envisioning that world. Not just envisioning it, but also preparing for it. And therein lies my hope, in that if there are enough of us everywhere, and there are, Paul Hawkins says that, you know, when he's talking about how many NGOs there are working on these pieces, um, that's the hope, is that it is this quiet mycelium mycelia that's forming underneath all our feet that is going to support us in the new life.
And that's the revolution. It's really, it's really revolution. It's like this time, just like the poem says, this time there won't be um, fists raised and people yeah. shouting, and there'll be, there'll be people hungry lines of people in the soup at the soup kitchens and and so forth. And I think that's probably accurate. It's not a violent re- revolution, but it's we are in the middle. All right, we are in the middle of the new revolution. And you at Warren Wilson are leading the way. I know it's true. I was just talking to a, this is off the subject, I was just talking to a class and and it was a first year class and yeah. they had had to deal with some dropout, you know, yeah. the re- low retention rate and so forth. And it's just very interesting to me that there are some people who just cannot, they're hanging on to the old stories so desperately that they cannot see the way they cannot see the new stories and their place in the new stories yeah. and can't even accept that mantle, which is going to be a mantle of courage and hard work. Resilience, resilience is a word I keep med- meditating on a lot mm-hmm. right now. And and that's, and that's what, in my personal life, my family focuses on that a lot. How are we going to be resilient in the coming hard times? Or it's not just coming hard times. The hard times are here. Mm-hmm. It hasn't rained at my house in a couple of months. Yeah. The hard times are here. So how are we resilient? Well, one thing, just one tiny idea is our garden is is raised beds. It's a pretty mm-hmm. huge garden. We have a couple of them. They're, the beds are raised, not because I wouldn't be gardening in rows if I could. I wouldn't have done all that double digging mm-hmm. if I... But what we learned is that if we don't raise the beds, when a, when a, a rain event happens that drops five inches of rain mm-hmm. in two hours, our crops are inundated. Mm-hmm. So we've had to raise the beds and mulch. We've had to mulch because it, when the water comes, mulching protects what water is in the soil. And we've been able to get through these two months of drought. Right, because so, we have Exactly. So that's why I'm just looking for resilience in all its forms right now. I like that. Yeah, don't you? You Thank you. speak so beautifully. I'm forced to do it a lot. <laughs> it's and I, it's and I choose skill. to do it a lot. <laughs> and somehow, um, so this my life has been sort of a search for my voice and, and a, a search for, for wisdom. A search for what we need to hear to become better people, to become happier people as if happiness mattered, but to become, to lead lives that just make more and more sense instead of less and less sense, and that lives that are just, peaceable, sustainable. Thank you for your good questions. Thank you for your fabulous answers. And thank you for all that you're doing at Warren Wilson. And same to you. Thank you. To make the world a better.